we're in a series of messages where we're talking about quitting the things that take life and starting the things that give life. Because all of us pretend. It's, it's just human nature that we're concerned about the things that are going on in the external aspects of our lives. And so, so we, we put on a show sometimes. We dress up really nice when we go out to dinner, even though we don't like the person we're going out to dinner with. We sometimes show up at church and, and we're looking all happy as a whole family, but the whole rest of the week we're yelling at each other. We throw some money into a plate when people are looking, but other than that, we don't give generously at any other point in our lives. I don't know what it might be for you, but at some level, whether small or large, we're all pretending. And that level of pretending creates a burden of frustration on us that is just consistent. It just lingers with us. And so we're in a series that we started on Easter, talking about how to quit those things. And there's a verse in the Bible that we've been using as sort of a reference point for us throughout this journey. And it's in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. If you have your note sheets, go ahead and pull that out. It's on the inside of your bulletin. We've got these little note sheets. Pull it out, and the verse will also be on the screen up here. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, this is profound because a lot of us would say, my life consists in the balancing of the externals and the internals. Trying to keep the externals in line with the internals, and I'm trying to do that. This says, no, it's not really so much about the externals at all. It all comes from the heart. Focus your energies on what's on the inside first, and then life flows out of that. This is a profound thought, that all I really need to do in my life is invest in the heart, and the other stuff will flow out of that. Guard your heart. And so back on Easter Sunday, we talked about quitting what we call churchianity, this religious sort of going through the motions that sometimes people do and beginning to say, what does it mean to follow Jesus from the heart? Or then the next week we talked about parenting and giving up some of the pretend frustrating aspects of parenting and getting back to what actually brings life and healing and wholeness to your family. Last week we talked about motherhood and I was encouraging the women present to give up the burdensome stuff that the culture puts on them. And today... We're talking about sexuality. We're talking about uh, human relationships in an intimate level. And specifically, I'm talking to the guys. Last week, women had their chance. This week, we're talking specifically to the guys. Because there's a passage we're going to be looking at in Proverbs chapter 5 that directly addresses men. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute. This is my first Sunday here. What's the deal here? Why, why are we talking about sexuality in church? Isn't that one of the topics that you don't talk about? Well, listen, the Bible has this book in it. I don't know how many of you have read it. It's called Song of Songs. Have you ever seen it? How, how many of you have actually read the Song of Songs? How many of you, when you read Song of Songs, your face blushed? Because it's crazy. It's like, it's like an, an erotic document that's in the middle of the Bible. And so sometimes... What people have done is they've tried to spiritualize it. And they've said, oh no, Song of Songs is actually an allegory of how God loves the church. How Jesus loves us. And isn't it so beautiful how intensely he loves us? Don't buy it. <laughs> because it's a, it's a song of love from Solomon to his new bride on how much he loves her and how he intends to love her. And it's a song from her to him on how much she loves him and how she intends to show her love to him. And don't read it unless you're married or very close to getting married. But it's seriously. So the guy who wrote Song of Songs also writes Proverbs 5. And so if you have one of our Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to that, to page 443. We're going to pick up on Proverbs 5, and we're going to read this. So like I said, today's message is mostly geared towards the men in the room, because the passage is mostly geared towards men, okay? But there are principles that apply to women also. There are also principles that apply to single people, because this is mostly to husbands about their wives. But there are principles about single people, too. And so I'm going to address some of those things in the process. But if you hear me talking a lot about, guys, this is how you need to treat your wives, don't blame me because that's what the passage is dealing with. And then try to pick up on the other principles as we go through. But here's the deal. Today's secret, I believe, is going to surprise you. 
I believe it's going to surprise you. So if you've already found Proverbs 5, Go ahead, and now I'm going to skip, and I'm going to give you your first blanks to fill in, because I want you to know the secret of how to be a great, unbelievable lover before we even open the passage and look at it. Here it is. Great lovers relish the exclusivity of marriage. If you're taking notes, write that down. Now, this is going to surprise you, because our culture does not connect great love stories with the preeminence of marriage. Some of you women have probably seen The Notebook. I don't even need to go any further than that. But the greatest love stories in our culture seem to say that marriage is one thing, but love is something different. But great lovers, the way God designed it, the way you can experience it, relish the exclusivity of marriage. Okay, so let's read the first six verses of Proverbs 5 here. Remember, this is the guy who wrote the most erotic book in the Bible, talking to his son. He says, verse 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to the words, to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life, her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Would you mind taking a break with me and let's just pray and ask for God to give us wisdom over what we read today. God. We recognize that there are principles in our culture that are far different from principles from you. And so today we pray that you would fill our hearts with this word, fill our minds with this word, that you would convince us of its truth, and that you would lift us in an optimistic, hopeful sense to the greatness of how you created us as human beings to live and to relate. Help us to see the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of the marriage relationship you created and allow us to, to view that as the framework in which all human sexuality should be expressed. And so, God, I pray that you would reveal those things to us through your word today. God, would you guard the words I speak and all of our thoughts and shape them to be holy and acceptable to you. When we pray this in Jesus' name, our Savior, King, and Lord. Amen. So as you look at that verse, the series of verses there, the first thing you'll notice is that this adulterous woman has lips that drip with honey and her speech is smoother than oil. Here's the thing. All sexual temptation looks great from the outside as you're beginning to toy with the possibility. It all looks great. Guys, you can look at a woman and you can say, wow, there's something phenomenal about that lady. And there's, there's this sense that you want to have a relationship with that person. You want to get close to them. And, and for some guys, you can know that this verse is true. You can look at a person, a woman, and you can say, man, her lips are dripping with honey. Her speech is smoother than oil. But here's the deal. No matter how good it might look, it results, check this out, verse 4, the end, she is bitter as gall. Listen, i got to make you a promise here. You get involved with the wrong kind of woman, and your mouth will taste bitterness for the rest of your life. This is not simply saying, okay, go ahead and have your fun, and then later on settle down. This is saying, wait a minute, you get involved with the wrong woman, and there will be a bitter taste in your mouth for the rest of of your life. But what really gets me is verse 5, where it says, Her feet go down to death, and her steps lead straight to the grave. God, through Solomon, is telling us that sexual promiscuity, being involved with the wrong kind of person, particularly guys getting involved with an adulterous woman, leads to death. And the grave. Now, 
The grave, the word here, is the Hebrew word Sheol, which in the New Testament is quite often translated as hell. Sometimes Jesus uses that word, that Sheol word, to refer to the eternal punishment that some people might encounter. But at the very least, the, the passage here is telling us that life isn't the result of this. You can talk to a lot of guys and they will get that temptation. And in the mind, this is what happens to men. In the mind, they see a temptation. They see a tempting woman. They see something out there and they think this thought. They think, wow, wouldn't my life reach a new level of excitement? Wouldn't my life reach a new level of enjoyment if I had some type of connection with that woman? And here's the truth. Life doesn't come from there. Life comes from the inside of your heart being what it's supposed to be. And then verse 6 is sort of the culmination of this. It says, she gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. See, here's the deal. Life moves. There is a principle in the Bible that is perhaps the most important principle of all. It's not a spiritual principle. It's just a, a lay down the law kind of practical. This is the way the world was designed. This is the way the world works. And it goes like this. Everyone is on a path somewhere. And the decisions you make today lead to the path that you are on. And they lead to the destination you end up with. I have a buddy of mine that uh, I've been in conversation with for like five years. And I've continued to try to encourage him to make wise choices, wise choices. Eventually, he moved out of the area, and I saw him post on Facebook about a year ago. He said, man, bad choices today result in a messed up life later. Why didn't anyone tell me this? And I was like, come on. You've got, you can't be serious with that, because this is one of the most fundamental principles in all of the Bible, and certainly in Proverbs. The choices you make today put you on a path that determine your, get it, determine your destination. You cannot choose your destination, but you can choose your next step. And the step is your path that leads you to your destination. And this passage tells us that the adulterous woman does not consider the end. She only considers the present. Many of you are in that position of considering only the present. And especially when it comes to sexuality, it's all about the present. And yet, look at this, this phrase at the end of verse 6, it says, her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Have you ever been in an experience where you see someone and they're walking a path and they look like this, a crooked path? That's like a drunkard. See, that's the analogy here. It's saying a person who only considers the present is like a drunk person who has no sense of of direction or future. They're just trying to make it up until and past their hangover. That's all they care about. And yet, the best way I can picture this is if you imagine life is like one of these moving walls. It's continuing to push. And either you are walking on a path that stays ahead of it, or you're lingering in the present saying, man, all I care about is the present and life is just going to push you. And whichever direction you happen to be pointing when life starts pushing you is the direction of your next step. Until finally you end up way over there or way over there someplace you never wanted to be. That's what we're told in the Bible adultery is all about. A relationship with an adulterous woman is all about that. So here we go. Here's your blank I want you to write down. And this is what it's saying. This is saying in verses 1 through 6 to eliminate, eliminate all sexuality that's outside the borders of your marriage. Eliminate all sexuality outside the borders of your marriage. Because that's the definition of adultery. Adultery, biblically speaking, is simply this. Sexuality that's outside the context and outside the umbrella of marriage. So, when Solomon tells his son to avoid adulterous women, he's not saying avoid the scamps, avoid the tramps. He's saying avoid all sexuality that's outside the bonds of marriage. Do you understand that? That's what he's talking about. So, um, I've written down a little phrase here.